All right, I've given my spoiler and non-spoiler reviews, covered what I thought of the episodes from like a higher level, and now it's time to get into the nitty gritty and break down these episodes scene by scene. Now join me today as I go through each scene and point out the things I liked, the things I didn't like, all of the Easter eggs and book spoiler type content from episode one of The Wheel of Time titled Leave Taking. Quick thank you to the video sponsor, audible.com, but more on them later. Before getting too far into the video, quick spoiler warning. This video is gonna carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers through episode one of the TV show, but also through The Dragon Reborn, the third book of The Wheel of Time. If you haven't read at least that far, you are very likely to be spoiled, so watch at your own risk. Now this episode opens with Moraine getting dressed and ready to go. The voiceover here is explaining some of the backstory and is probably the most exposition that we get in the show, but I do think it's necessary. You'll notice here that she's looking at a map of the Westlands. And although it's hard to make out, it actually appears to be the map from the books, which is a cool Easter egg. You'll notice she puts on her great serpent ring with the jewel at the center being blue, representing her Aja. Now this is an obvious change from the books in the sense that the rings don't have those big jewels on them, but it's one I don't have a strong opinion on. It is worth pointing out, however, as these rings will come up here in a moment. So here you see Maureen's Angrial, just as it's described in the books. I love that they show this, but we technically don't know if she uses it later in the episode. But I would imagine we will find out later in the story if and when Maureen used it, and what exactly it does, because we haven't been told anything about Angriol in the show so far. We then cut to the shot of two men running from four women of the Red Aja, led by Leandrin, played by Kate Fleetwood. I am not a huge fan of the costumes of the men here. They look a bit like straight out of Xena Warrior Princess. The reveal that the man is crazy and that his companion wasn't real was pretty cool to me, but I would have liked to have seen him actually fight back against the Red Sisters and maybe seen some battle scene to kick off the episode. I think it would have hooked non-readers a little better than what we got. One thing to notice here though in this scene is Leandrin's ring. When she has her hand open, the ring is red, which of course denotes that she is red Aja. But when you see her close her fist, the ring appears to turn black, representing that she's of the black Aja. Yes, this could just be the lighting, but I have a feeling it was shot that way on purpose. And I love the foreshadowing if that is the case. We then cut to Maureen and Lan overlooking where the man was found. Maureen mentions in the scene that there are rumors of four Taviran in the two rivers, which is their destination. And then they are all about the right age to be the Dragon Reborn. Now, I do not love this dialogue, as it really wouldn't make sense for Moraine to not have already been there. If there were four Taviran of the right age, why would she not have gone there already? And how does she know that they're Taviran? What rumors would there be getting around from the two rivers that there are four Taviran there? We don't see any signs of the fact that they're Taviran when she gets there. So I, I know they're just trying to set it up, but I did not like it. I thought it was unnecessary. Now, before cutting away, we get these shots of older buildings disguised as mountains. And I think it's kind of cool, hearkening back to the Age of Legends. I hope we get to see more of the Age of Legends at some point in the story. We then cut to this incredible landscape shot in the women's circle of the two rivers walking Egwene to her ceremony. Now, after being shoved into the river by Nynaeve, we see Egwene struggle in the river before finally just surrendering to it and floating calmly down the river rather than struggling. I love the symbolism here is this is clearly meant to represent surrendering to Sidar. I can't help but think that that is the source of the tradition in the show, like why they do this. And it'll probably tie in a little bit to the colors in the pool that we've seen in the promos. We cut to Tam and Rand walking down the mountain path. And as soon as I saw this, I got chills. Also, get me one of those sweaters that Yosha is wearing. Here we cut to Tam carrying the brandy into the wine spring inn. And we get this shot of Day's Conger, who is one of my favorites from the episode. Tell me that you do not want to hang out with Day's Conger. She will drink you under the table, I have a feeling. We also get the scene of Matt playing dice and losing. Now, I love that they're setting up Matt as a gambler because once he starts winning later in the series, this will be a fun callback to when he always lost. They're also setting up Matt to be somebody who steals, and we later find out why. Pay attention to this bracelet right here as it will come up later. Here we get one of the most awkwardly delivered pieces of dialogue in the show. My girl, you're back. I was worried though. I am not a huge fan of the way Bran Alvear is portrayed here, but Daze Conger makes up for it. As always, uh, I want to go out and hang out with Daze, if I haven't made that clear. Here we get the scene from the teaser they released at Comic-Con. 
they did not change anything. So the continuity breaking teleporting from Perrin is still there. These scenes have been heavily edited. So I'm wondering if they couldn't use certain shots and couldn't come back and do reshirts because of COVID and actor availability. Oh yeah, and the fact that later they're gonna destroy the set. There are just way more choppy cuts here than in any other place in the series. And I can't help but think some of the production problems fed into that. Here we get Nynaeve asking about where Layla is to Perrin and then saying she's probably at the forge and iron is hard to work alone. This was an awkwardly delivered line, but I think it does make sense in the context that we see later in the episode. So as we will see in the next scene, there is something going on here that isn't explained to us. And there are some clues though. When Perrin goes to see Layla at the forge, he mentions to her that she didn't go to a Gwen ceremony and she barely talks to him. He puts his hands directly on her stomach and she has the look of somebody who has gone through trauma. I feel like she's either pregnant, recently had a miscarriage, can't get pregnant and wants to, or there's another theory that will come up later that she's secretly a dark friend, something I am not sold on. Here we get the introduction to Matt's family and backstory. Now they are setting up Matt as the caretaker really for his sisters and giving him a reason to be sort of gray as a character. He steals and gambles, but he's doing it for the right reason. He's trying to support his sisters. At first, I didn't really like the change to his backstory, but I do think that it actually accelerates his character development, and I think the change is going to work very well on the show. It shows that Matt is always willing to do the right thing, just not always in the best way. Here we get scenes of Rand and Egwene together. They are for sure trying to set this up as a legitimate relationship rather than a quasi-relationship like in the books. I do think this way works better than the way they portray them in the books because you never get the feeling that they really cared about each other at all, just that they thought they were supposed to care about each other. The fact that they make sexy time here is not a surprise considering they aged up Egwene to be the same age as Rand, and that makes sense too. Here we get a bath scene with Lan and Moraine, and how about that warder ass? That is all I have to say here. Here we get a scene with Rand and Egwene post freaky time and they are clearly setting up the tension between them as he is more focused on her really than she is on him. It's a great part of Egwene's arc actually. She's always focused on growth, development, and her future. And while Rand just wants simplicity. To me, it's great writing and it's closer to the books than people are giving it credit for because this is actually the dynamic at play there. Here we get Pot on Fane riding into town. Look at that smile. Johan Myers is so good for this role. The most important thing here though is this whistle. Now this is gonna come up again in some future episodes, but listen to that exact tune and, and remember it. I love this foreshadowing, this is so well done. Here we get the scene of Layla in bed with Perrin holding on to his pinky. Now take a look here though at her arms. See the cuts and scars? This could mean quite a few things. First, it would certainly feed the narrative that she's depressed or is suffering from depression. They, they also carry a similar look to the cut that Egwene will later have on her arm from her women's circle test. So maybe that these are remnants of that as well on Layla. I'm leaning a little bit more into the depression angle as it explains the coldness on her face and the line from Nynaeve about cleverly telling Perrin that it's hard to work iron alone. And that's really just a way to get Perrin to go back to her that Layla shouldn't be on her own. But I'm sure there will be more on this that we get later, but I do like that they're setting something up here. Here we get Matt and Pat on Fane. I cannot stress how much I love Johan Myers as Pat on Fane. I wish we had more of him. Here is Matt selling the bracelet from earlier, but he does end up getting lanterns for his family that they're gonna need in an upcoming scene. So again, falling into the he supports his family thing. Here we get another incredible shot. This landscape is amazing. This scene serves as basically the point where Rand and Egwene break up. What's great here is, is that Rand actually knows Egwene. Before she can even tell him that she's going to accept becoming uh, Nynaeve's apprentice, he says, I know. It's basically the moment that Rand knew that she had the opportunity, he knew her well enough that she was gonna take it. And I love that development here between the two of them. Here we get Nynaeve cleaning up the pool. There is paint here on the rocks, which implies it's been used for that purpose and that's why Nynaeve is cleaning it. We don't get the advertised scene of Egwene popping up out of the water and the paint in this episode. So there's an implication that that has happened already and we may see it in a flashback and that's why Nynaeve is cleaning it now. One thing that is awesome about this scene is Moraine very slyly pulling out Nynaeve's age out of their conversation, basically eliminating Nynaeve from the Dragon Reborn discussion. We also get a short bit of backstory on why Nynaeve does not trust Aes Sedai. She tells of the previous wisdom walking to the White Tower, 
and being turned away because she looked poor. Now, don't mistake that for the truth, though. Moraine says nothing here. She does not confirm that. It's very well possible that she could have been turned away because she couldn't channel strongly enough. Again, keep in mind, in the books, there's always unreliable narrators. Don't think that they're not going to do that here as well. Here we get a scene of Nynaeve and Egwene listening to the wind. Now, they both feel something wrong coming, which is foreshadowing for the Trollocs and Fade. They're going to come here soon. This scene also tells us that Egwene can do the same thing Nynaeve can do, which is obvious in that they can both channel, but the viewers don't know that yet, and neither do the characters. Here we get Lan investigating the Trollocs and Fade. We get these dead sheep, likely killed by a Trolloc for sport. Now, what's cool here is that they're arranged in the shape of a dragon's fang. What's kind of funny is I'm not sure why a Murdral would take time to warn everyone that way, but it does look creepy, so good job, Dan the Murdral. Here we get a scene of Creeper Moraine watching the boys drink. Perrin and Rand give Matt money, and you see the struggle on his face because they give him money for lanterns that he's already got because of the money he stole. So you could see him struggle to take their money, but the friendship is real. We then move back to the Althor farm where they are setting up their candle with their lantern. Now, these lanterns are a new addition to the show. They're not in the books, but they do a good job of giving a reason for Beltine that makes sense to also allow them explain the Wheel of Time, reincarnation, and rebirth. They are very heavily leaning into that in the show. It comes up multiple times in the first couple of episodes, as you can see in Tam's speech here. Also, because it's much later in the books, and I don't want to get into spoilers, I won't say too much on this, but Tam's speech is almost pulled directly from a scene later in the books, and it very much pertains to Rand's plotline. This is great setup for that moment as well. Also during this speech, we get shots of the main characters lighting lanterns as well for lost loved ones. We get this scene here of Perrin and Layla embracing with somber faces. I can't help but think that this supports the idea of a miscarriage that not everyone knows about, but Nynaeve does, which explains again why Perrin needed to go be with her and why Nynaeve encouraged that. After this, we get the beginnings of the Beltine celebration. The music is festive and it does appear to be a great time. They're setting the mood for a dramatic shift here soon. And when the first Trolloc does kill Tom, RIP Tom, I do love the abrupt shift in tone. I think that it works here because it is so jarring and it's meant to be. The camera work is also great here. They utilize shaky cam well, showing the confusion of everybody by shaking the camera around. So we're just as confused as the people are. Nobody was prepared to defend themselves. Nobody thought monsters would be showing up. The first reveal of the Trolloc is awesome. I absolutely love the way these Trollocs look. So very well done here. Just great effects. Love this shot here of Pot on Fane putting his cup down and just quietly walking away, implying that he did have something to do with this, which we know he did. We also get Matt finding out that his sisters are missing, and rather than helping, his parents are hiding. This is a great character moment for Matt, because this is exactly the decision he would make in the books. He does the right thing, and he goes to find his sisters, no matter the cost to him. We then cut to the Althor farm. Bella is warning them that something is up here because she is the creator. Then, the Trolloc busts through the door. I love how massive the Trolloc is, but the money shot is Tam pulling out his sword, and flashing that heron mark on the blade. I am a huge fan of this fight, but rather than killing one Trolloc and struggling with it, which a Blade Master probably wouldn't, I would have preferred to see a bunch of Trollocs attacking the farm and Tam cutting them down but being injured in the process of killing a couple. I think that it would have played into the surprise that Rand had seeing his father fight. Now that surprise is still there though. Look at this face here as Tam pulls that sword out. I just think it would have made a better scene and left us with more questions about Tam, which I thought would have been cool. Now here we get Moraine's entry into the battle, and I'm not gonna lie, I loved this part. The CGI is not perfect, but it's pretty good, and seeing her badass face gives me chills, especially when I saw it the first time in that IMAX theater. We don't get these scenes in the books, we just know they happened. So seeing them on screen was awesome to me. I love the way Moraine and Lan work together here. You can see her duck when Lan swings, showing their bond even though that has not yet been explained in the show. We also get this amazing scene of Daze Conger leading some other women and killing a Trolloc. You want a real feast? Come and get some of this! Now, given that I have already professed my undying love for Daze Conger in the show so far, you know I love this scene. Do not with Day's Conger. We then go back to the forge where a Trolloc breaks in and attacks them. I know everyone is on the Layla is a dark friend theory, but I don't actually think it makes much sense. Here we see Perrin about to be killed by a Trolloc, 
and rather than letting it happen, she attacks the Trolloc and saves Perrin. That is not something you would do if you wanted him dead. Here we see the Trolloc take Nynaeve and run off with her. Notice that it did not kill her, but it rather tried to capture her. And I think that was deliberate as they were after the Emmonsfield Five. They weren't necessarily trying to kill them. Now we cut back to the fight in the forge and we see Perrin lose his cool and go Berserker Perrin on the Trolloc, hacking away at it repeatedly with his axe until the last minute he turns and hits Layla with his axe in the stomach, killing her. Now I'm not sure if it's pertinent or not, but you'll notice that it was in her stomach that he hits her. If she was pregnant or if she had already lost a baby, it might be symbolic to Perrin. In this scene though, Layla has her hammer held above Perrin's head and the Trolloc clearly appears to be dead leading many to believe that Layla may have been trying to kill Perrin and that she is a dark friend. Now, I don't believe this because yes, it does look like she's about to swing it, but it also could have been because there was a Trolloc there. She may not have seen that it was dead yet. She had that chance earlier to kill him and did not. I'm not sure why she would do it now when it's possible he could defend himself. I don't think that makes much sense, but there is clearly something going on with her character that I think we are going to find out about later. We then cut to Moraine fighting the remaining Trollocs after being injured. I love the look of these Trollocs. Again, I thought they were awesome, but it is very, very kind of them to wait for Moraine to recover and start channeling again before attacking. That's very considerate and Trollocs are very, very chivalrous. Now, one thing I did find odd here was Moraine is literally taking apart the Winespring Inn, a place where many of the villagers likely went to escape the attacking Trollocs. I think there were probably other ways to do this scene that did not involve tearing the inn down and possibly killing everyone inside, including the ones she was there to protect, but it did look cool, so there's that. We then cut to this last scene with Rand arriving in the village and seeing utter destruction. I love the visuals here and that the village is in complete tatters. I was not a fan of how quickly Tam recovered after his healing, but again, this probably had to do with the timing in the episode. This is actually my biggest gripe with the last scene. I, I actually think it hurts the episode as a whole because it just went too fast. The episode I think would have felt a lot differently if they had taken another five to 10 minutes and done this scene right. They needed to establish why the specific characters needed to leave, and then they needed to have the right encouragement and debate before doing so. The fact that it felt so rushed, I think is why people left the episode with more of a problem with it. That being said, I absolutely loved the usage of the opening lines of the book here at the end. It worked really well. So that's my breakdown of Leave Taking, episode one of The Wheel of Time. What did you think of the episode? Are there any Easter eggs or cool things that I missed? Let me know in the comments of the video. Also, big thank you to Audible, the sponsor of this video. They're giving all of my viewers a free audiobook. All you have to do is head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus and sign up for the free trial. You're going to be able to keep the book even if you don't keep the service. And there is a brand new version of Eye of the World read by Rosamund Pike that I highly recommend getting. It is awesome. It's very cool to hear her do it. Make sure also to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. I'm trying to get caught up on these breakdown videos before next week. So keep an eye out for a bunch of these coming. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, peace out.